Welcome to Uncommons. I'm your host, Nathaniel Erskine Smith. On this episode, we're focused on the question of platform governance. How should these big tech companies like Facebook and Google that control so much information about us and where we live so much of our lives, how should they be regulated and governed? And I'm joined by expert Taylor Owen. He is a professor at McGill University. He is the chair there in media, ethics, and communications. He has written extensively on the subject. He has worked with other experts on this subject extensively as well. And he's certainly someone that I rely upon for advice. Taylor, thank you for joining me. My pleasure. You have attended before us at the International Grand Committee in June, and you laid out a number of problems and solutions. But for those who were not paying attention to the International Grand Committee, which is, I think, a fair number of people, what is the case for platform governance? What is the problem you are trying to solve? We've seen this term platform governance and this kind of concept emerge um, pretty recently in response to a very particular phenomena, which is, I think, best defined by looking at uh, what the internet was and how it's evolved. And I like to think of this as sort of the original internet being a highly decentralized network that really empowered individuals and individual nodes, particularly on the internet, right? Anyone who had access to the internet could all of a sudden um, have a voice. And when you added social media onto that, all of a sudden an individual could not just have voice, but could have access to collective action, right? They could organize together and they could find like-minded people. And these were really powerful things. Um, but something in the last five or so years has shifted where the, the main um, filter point of the internet has, has not been these smaller websites or these smaller groups of people self-organizing, but has actually been... Um, a small number of global companies. So uh, we can think of Facebook and Apple and Amazon and Google. Um, and the reality of the internet now is not that decentralized internet. It is a, a highly filtered ecosystem where almost everything goes through these platforms, almost everything we do online. And because these platforms touch so many aspects of our lives, right? The, think about the, all the different ways Facebook and Google and Amazon interact with our economy, with our politics, with all of our social interactions, with our education system, right? They, they touch so many aspects of our lives that they need to, to come into, or they do come into contact with our governance system. So how we are going to govern these global companies that are somewhat mismatched with our traditional governance institutions and our traditional rules and laws to govern other technologies and aspects of our society are kind of mismatched with these new technologies. So the, the field and the discussion about go platform governance emerges from that disconnect. At the same time, the network effects bring positive benefits to individual users and Facebook wouldn't be the same value if my friends from law school weren't on it or my friends from high school weren't on it. And so the the more people that are on it, the better off I am for connecting to people to begin with. But you identify a, a structural problem with the financial incentives that Facebook and Google face. Look, I mean, the baseline here, of course, is that um, these technologies and these companies, I mean, we have to be clear, these are large um, publicly traded private institutions, right? So let's be clear on what they are. Um, but the technologies that they have developed have had astounding positive impact on society, right? And that, that's the baseline into that. The challenge is, is in particular, I would say two core problems with how they've evolved. One is what you mentioned, the financial model, right? There, for a long time, it's, it's, you have to remember that up until very recently, these companies didn't make money. In fact, they were, they were bu built on a business model that said simply growth and user base was enough for the market to value them. We'll figure out how to monetize it later. We'll monetize later. It's all about scale at the moment, right? So Amazon historically grew through almost its entire history up until now without ever making a profit, right? And yet they were one of the most valuable companies in the world. Same with Facebook, same with Google. Um, the business model that particularly Google and Facebook landed on though was kind of broadly can be described as the attention economy, right? Where um, it is our, the, the attention of the users that is the product that they are 
selling and marketing and, and commoditizing. And that can either be through just our time spent on the sites, so the amount of ads we can be exposed to. But on the flip side of that, it is our behavior. So it is the ability to sell to anybody who might want to influence our behavior access to data about us that allows messages to be targeted that can impact our behavior, right? So that, that's one structural piece of this. The other is just the vast scale on which these companies operate. So there's over 2 billion posts to Facebook a day, right? Like this is a huge amount of content flowing through this ecosystem. And that scale presents some real structural problems too. How do you moderate and oversee that kind of magnitude of social interaction? This is not like a newspaper or a radio station deciding what's going on their airwaves. These companies sit in a very different place in terms of how they mediate content. And different to with respect to even the micro targeting where if I want to place an ad that is targeted by way of Canada Post with direct mail or I want to place an ad in a particular magazine or newspaper because of the audience that I'm aiming to reach, there, there's always been targeting, but the scale and reach of this is different. Yes, and I would say the, there, it's, there is something intrinsic in my view to the, both the, the combination of the real collected and inferred data about an individual and the ability to use um, artificial intelligence to target messages at that particular set of data. And it's, I mean, I don't think, like, this isn't a clear cut case, but there is an argument that that in certain instances for certain kinds of communication gives a power that I think we want to check. And so an example of a type of information we might want to, to limit with this kind of power is um, political advertising, right? So if we think speech in an election or political speech is something that um, is sacrosanct in a democracy, we may want to make it more transparent than this system allows. If the problem overall is a structural one, we see what you call symptoms of that problem that most of us would point to and say, well, we definitely want to avoid those. There's a, there's a laundry list of supposed negative harms of these technologies that gets talked about a lot in the media. I think they often get conflated with one another. And sometimes these companies get a bad rap for like every bad thing that happens on them being sort of blamed by the maliciousness of their CEOs or whatever it might be, right? But I do think there's some big categories we need to be concerned of here. I think election integrity is a big one. It's been shown that these platforms can be abused in this like critical moment in a democracy. We've seen problems with hate speech and harmful speech, the ways in which speech can be weaponized on these platforms that cause real harm in a way that's different than our old system. We've seen real challenges around how data is used and the abuse of that data. And we've seen challenges with the free market, right? I think it's pretty clear that these companies operate in certain instances like traditional monopolies. And we know from history that traditional monopolies can have a negative impact on society. So there, there's definitely some, some negative externalities, if you want to put it that way, of these technologies that I think it's the responsibility of governments to engage with. I mean, the, the whole point of governance is to maximize positive benefits of, in society and to minimize negative externalities. And there's some clear damage that's coming from the way these technologies are embedded in our society. And obviously, we now have the leaders of some of these companies that are acknowledging self-regulation is insufficient, and we, we need governments to step in and fill that space. Some governments certainly are. We've, we've in Canada been addressing, I think, a number of the externalities, as you call them, but the election integrity issue, we, the impact on civic journalism, for example, the data privacy piece as well, slowly but surely trying to tackle these issues in a serious way. You helpfully identify specific categories of problem and solution. And I, and I think it, it would be worthwhile to go through category by category. So when we talk about micro-targeting, for example, you've identified a potential problem with respect to election integrity. Transparency seems like the obvious answer there. Yeah, I think like a degree of accountability and transparency inside these systems, if we agree that they're, it's a powerful tool, being anybody getting access to target anybody with very sophisticated data about their lives, 
is something maybe we should bring some more transparency to. Now, the Canadian government's, I think, gone quite far in terms of mandating this in an election. And I think that system was shown to have worked quite well. I'm not sure why we should limit it just to elections. And I, I hope that that model expands internationally to other countries. It's, 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 a, it's not a difficult problem to solve, in my view. And similarly, the privacy problem seems a, a relatively straightforward one, in some respects at least, where we have a fairly strong model in Canada when it was first developed and, and adopted in 2000. But we now, in 20 years later, can look to the EU or California and credibly say we should catch up to where they are. And is that where you think our privacy laws ought to go? Yeah, I mean, I think as a baseline, there's just some modernization that needs to happen across different jurisdictions of our privacy law. And we know broadly the roadmap that needs to take. I do think there's some... So on that front, yes, it's. I mean, that would be relatively easy to update, I think. Um, the bigger challenge is... Are we really going to, um, how are we going to view data privacy as a, as a society, as a whole? Um, and I think there's a real push towards giving rights to the individual to monetize their data, for example, to own it. Um, I'm not sure that's quite the right model. I think we also need to look at the collective use of data. Um, and right now we're in the situation where really it's only a few companies in the world that have access to the scale of database that you need to, for example, develop machine learning algorithms. Um, and that data is based on data that's, be, or that, those data sets are based on data that's been collected over the past decade by these large companies. So th there's some more difficult privacy challenges in there. Um, how you get enough sc scaled data to allow AI and machine learning companies to emerge in your economy. And that's, that's a really, that's a difficult problem. But the baseline, should we be giving individuals more rights over their data and more protections? Uh, I think is is clear. You make a good point about the trade-off here. We don't want to be so strict about privacy at the front end that we lose the value of data on the back end. No, absolutely not. And I think, and and that's where consent becomes important. What do we know we're consenting to, and is that meaningful? And in some cases, I would argue too, drawing lines to ensure that consumers are protected because we can't expect individuals to police every contract. The Privacy Commissioner has gone down this road a little bit with some of his consultations, but take cookies as an example when you are when you go to a website and do you accept the cookies? I mean, at some point, you don't have time. Think about that. And so there should be a rule to protect consumers in place. And maybe it's just simply a matter of anonymity and, and individual level tracking, right? So that certain information can be used upon aggregation, but the micro targeting aspect or the ability to resell the information for future targeting purposes is precluded. That's a great example of what is a larger, almost philosophic question at the center of a lot of this, which is how much of the governing of the internet should be down to individual agency or down to some sort of governance system that is responsible for collective actions. And, uh, I would argue that there is a bias in the tech world towards individual agency, right? So that, because that pushes back against the idea that either tech companies or platforms have liability for the things that happen on them. It's much better for them to say, well, we are just the sum of the individual activities of individual citizens. And they are ultimately the ones who are responsible for the content they share, for the way they use our technologies, for the activities that stem from our technologies. Um, and in, in my, and if you, if you take that view, then the sole actor of responsibility and of governance is that individual, right? And I, I for the, exactly the reason you lay out, these are very complex systems that there's no way an individual can truly know, um, how their data is being used, how these technologies function. There, there needs to be a role of a government to, to create that kind of collective accountability. I expect in general terms there to be a trade-off, but I want the government and experts and people with my interest at heart who better understand these issues to be drawing the lines in a clear, in, in a clear fashion. The civic media piece. You have been part of the Shattered Mirror Report as a researcher and writer. This doesn't appear to be a problem born out of the structure that you identified before, but it is a problem nonetheless. It's born of the structure in the sense, almost as a byproduct of the structure, in that it just so happens that 
as these platforms grew and their business model moved into the targeted advertising space, it cannibalized the core business model of journalism. This wasn't intentional. It was just, it's just sort of a byproduct of them doing something much more efficiently than media companies were able to do. And so not only did the platform companies essentially take the distribution model for journalism, right? The audience moved to Facebook from print media, but they undermined these core revenue sources, the subscription uh, revenue model and the class of the advertising revenue model. So if you think the access to reliable information that journalism once provided is a core function of our democracy, and if you think this service is being insufficiently provided by the market, which I would argue it is, it, 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 it is, it, is being, it's being insufficiently provided by the way in which information now circulates via platforms, then there's probably an argument for government to rectify that and balance through some sort of uh, regulation or subsidy. Let's assume this, that civic media is a public good. So I think you and I are on the same page in, in that regard. And then when we go to design a policy, there are media startups, whether it's Canada Land or whether it is The Athletic from a sports point of view, but you can imagine civic journalism taking on a, a similar flavor where you have journalists in different cities that are feeding into a, a larger website that that hosts civic journalism. Do we fund those startup efforts? Do we say to the Toronto Star and the Globe Mail, we've got to help you with producing civic journalism because you're not getting the revenue that you used to get, but we're not going to force a huge change in the business model. Is it okay to at least identify civic media as a public good and then say, okay, there are different iterations of, of the solution from there? Or are there more obvious solutions? I personally believe that the production of civic journalism and accountability journalism is the good that needs to be incentivized, not the institutional or corporate structure that creates it. So there are nonprofits that create civic journalism, there are startups, and there are traditional legacy media organizations, and there are public broadcasters. And all of those get, need to be incentivized in different ways. Um, the problem in, in Canada, as we're talking about our policy here, in my view, is that we focused on one of those categories, almost to the exclusion of the others. Um, we have subsidized labor for large traditional media organizations, um, which sure, they're, they're in a tough place um, and they're declining in terms of the amount they're able to produce. Um, but in my view, they are also embedded in a business model that is in per sort of perpetual decline. Um, and if we wanna cover our base here, we should probably look at a much more dynamic ecosystem of small companies, of nonprofits, and figure out how to help them scale in this, in this market. And we simply haven't done that. So there's, there's a dozen different ways in to doing that this range of policy to support journalism, including, frankly, um, reforming our public broadcasters. I mean, that's, that's the one place that government clearly has some authority um, and some um, jurisdiction. And they've done very little to reform actually how public broadcasters function. Um, in our media ecosystem. We need to look at a, a pretty wide range of policies, but, but we've really neglected, to my view, the most important pieces of it so far. It's relevant to a conversation with tax policy in a way, because when you, and there are a few different places that tax policy conversation can go, and you've written recently about tax arbitrage, which I want to get to, but before, before that, I mean, just to close out the civic media piece, where you have Facebook and Google principally that have cannibalized the revenue in many respects as now publishers of news content that they did not create. Should they not be paying back into that system of creation? These international companies, like many other international companies, uh, neither pay corporate tax in Canada or tax on charge tax on the goods and services that they provide in our jurisdiction. Right? So they are, they're undertaxed, in my view, in the Canadian market. And that's because they exist offshore, they're global companies, it's not clear where the good and service is actually provided, right? So there's, there's complexities about their model that, that don't fit clearly within our tax regime. Then the question is, um, if you agree that that should be fixed, that they should pay more tax, 
um, because they're clearly providing a good and engaging in the Canadian economy. How should that money be collected and where should it go? And one argument is that the clearest place that it, where there's been a negative implication of their economic activity is, is the media space, right? Where not really of, of Facebook or Google's fault, um, they've just created a much more efficient product that by providing it in the Canadian market has undermined the business model that used to subsidize a thing we think is a civic good, which is a collection of journalism. So maybe you should direct those tax revenue to fixing that problem. Because unlike your traditional disruption, which causes great consternation in the workforce, but doesn't cause a disruption in the, the product that I ultimately receive as a consumer in many respects. So if I take Uber as an example, I used to take a cab. Now I take an Uber. I, those taxi cab drivers have been completely disrupted and their business model has been disrupted. But as a consumer, I'm still able to get from point A to point B. But from a news generation perspective, if Facebook and Google are not in the business of producing news, but they are cannibalizing the revenue of those that do, what, what steps in to produce the, the civic journalism that is the public good? It's not necessarily Google and Facebook's responsibility that we decide as a society that we collectively value the thing that they have that their business model has marginalized, right? So there's nothing stopping the Canadian government or any government from funding that thing out of their general revenue if they think it's of collective benefit to society, right? So the Canadian government can decide to subsidize journalism startups and the production of civic media with or without taxing Facebook and Google directly or with or without using that tax revenue from those companies to directly that problem, right? In fact, they prob it's probably more efficient to figure out how they want to tax these companies, put that in general revenue, and then deal with the civic media problem, right? Which is, can be dealt with in all sorts of different ways, um, through labor subsidies, through incentives for startups, through reforming a public broadcaster, right? To me, those are all things that need to be figured out in, a, in, a, in relation to the particular governance problem, which is how do you support civic media? The tax problem, I think, should be treated a bit separately. No, but that's that's fair. And I guess I'm thinking of it more from the perspective of they are profiting from content that they did not create. And therefore, it is more of, in some cases, a copyright question. And I know the EU is going through this conversation about reforming copyright rules. And, and that's probably in the same way I think that these platforms ought to be responsible for the negative content that they post in some respects. They also, where they are posting other companies or other individuals content and and profiting from the eyeballs they probably should be there should be a fair sharing profit sharing i suppose is is maybe the answer and it's less about a tax policy directly as, as opposed to profit sharing yeah well, that's what some governments have done right like the australian government has just put that in place they're saying look we're going to be mandated profit sharing essentially off revenue on content journalistic content it's going to go right back to the publishers and that intuitively makes more sense to me whereas the tax conversation i think you're probably right you just wrote about the need for a digital bread and woods and one of the anchors to that article and, and argument is that you have these inner large multinational tech companies that are profiting in canada but paying taxes elsewhere they briefly alluded to the uh, we're not collecting either sales tax or corporate tax off the economic activity of a dominant actor in our society. Ireland's getting all our tax money. Absolutely, right? <laughs> and the sales tax is going somewhere else. Now, there could be an argument that these goods and services are providing such a benefit to our economy that we're willing to with forego that tax revenue simply for their presence in our economy. And I think that's increasingly untenable, though, because we're starting to see some of the economic harms that are coming from this model. And it seems clear to me that that's an easy place where governments, particularly as governments, I would argue, coming out of this recession we're in, um, are going to be looking for more revenue. Um, I strongly suspect this is going to be a place they're going to start coming um, because the companies that are going to emerge the most powerful out of this recession, um, I suspect, are going to be the global platform companies. There are some policies we can fairly quickly put into place. I I've never understood the attack on the Netflix tax, for example, I, I kind of roll my eyes and think you mean 
putting HST or GST on a company that our Canadian equivalent already pays. It doesn't make any sense to me. That's a great example. So, so with all this platform governance stuff, right? There's, I mean, there's dozens of policies, which is what makes it complicated, right? There's lots of different avenues in which to get at this problem. But what we haven't talked about is the political layer here. And a lot of these problems are simply political ones. And the Netflix tax is a great example of that, right? Like for some weird quirk in that one election, all of a sudden the idea of taxing Netflix um, became this untouchable third rail in Canadian politics. And don't get me wrong, I love Netflix, but I also think they should be collecting and remitting GST. <laughs> Look, I, I don't have a lot of love for the Canadian telecoms and cable companies, but man, if I was trying to sell Crave, I'd be pretty pissed off, right? So that's an easy one, I think. So, And frankly, we did this, we levied t- uh, sales tax on Uber. Okay, fair. So just keep doing it on on all of the tech companies that operate in Canada. The arbitrage opportunity is not possible for a single state actor, which is, I think, the need for, among other policy problems that require international cooperation, but that is one of the policy problems that led you to call for a digital bread and woods. One of the dynamics that makes governing this space really difficult is that these is back to that scale issue that these companies operate globally on with billions of users and billions of pieces of content. That means that the actions of any one country are likely going to be insufficient in shifting any sort of structural dynamics. One of the results of that is you've had the emergence of some large blocks of countries that can have an impact. The United States clearly is one because these countries are largely governed by American law and are sort of embedded in American ideologies and traditions. A Chinese bloc that is building out its own parallel tech stack. And third, sort of an EU bloc that is really trying to put the rights of individual users at the center of how technologies are governed. Those three are able to do it because of market power. That puts countries like Canada in a very tricky spot. There are some things that we cannot do. We cannot, for example, impose antitrust law on Facebook and break it up. The US can do that. Maybe the EU can have a similar effect through competition policy, but us as a single country with our market size can't. So that means that we have this global collective action problem where countries need a forum in which to band together on some of these policies, and it doesn't currently exist. And from a parliamentary perspective, that's certainly what led us to push for this international committee of over 10 parliaments focused on these issues. And hopefully we continue to have these kinds of meetings. I know we were planning to have one in June in Washington, which obviously is not going to happen now in the context of the pandemic. But the need for international cooperation where data flows so easily as between borders, our privacy and data protection regulators, they need to be able to work together to better regulate these international actors. And then as parliaments and as governments, we need to make sure that we are, I think, working not always exactly from the same policy handbook, but certainly driving towards the same goal overall. You hit the nail on, I think, two key aspects there. One is that there is going to be rightfully national differentiation in how some of these policies are enacted, right? Like hate speech is a great example of that, that every country has a, has laws around speech. Right. E- even in North America, we have a very different understanding. Of course, right? And like Germany bans Nazi speech for very particular historical reasons. Other countries don't, and that is their right to do that. So there will be national differentiation on some of this stuff. Some of it there might not be, right? Just taxing platforms might be more efficient if everybody just decides on a rate and enforces it all at once, right? And there's, so some things will be standardized, but some things won't. The second piece though, is that we need to learn from each other. Governments are stepping into this space where there's a ton of uncertainty in what the effect of regulation and legislation and and application of laws are gonna be. So when Germany put in their hate speech law, for example, and forced platforms to take down anything that was flagged as hate speech, there were lots of repercussions of that, some positive and some downstream negative effects. But now all other governments in the world can learn from that experiment. So I think, yes, governments need to be coordinate better, but they also just need to learn from each other and then iterate policies in this space off of each other. And that's a big thing that some sort of global 
organization could help do? Canada has led the way in many respects with respect to a registry for election ads and to combat harmful micro-targeting. Australia, you mentioned, that is finding a way to treat civic media as a public good and enforce some stronger profit sharing. And the EU and California that have led the way on data privacy. With respect to liability for content online, we've seen Germany with the first go at this. And based on some of the conversation we had at the International Committee, that may not be the best way of going about it. Do you have a particular view of that hard problem? Harmful and hate speech, we have a clear tension between the need for a democratic society to protect free speech and the ability of individuals to speak on these platforms and the mandate of governments to protect their citizens from the harmful effects of other people's speech. I think governments are going to land on different points of that tension. The United States is clearly leaning towards the protection of free speech side of that spectrum. They are willing as a society to accept much higher rate of harmful speech and effects of that harmful speech in order to protect the right for people to speak. Germany sits on the other side of that. They've said, look, we know and we've seen and experienced the harm of unmitigated free speech. And we are therefore going to lean more heavily on the protection from those harms. I think Canada needs to figure that out. And I don't think we've had a great conversation about where we want to sit on that. It's so easy to become a fractious debate in politics of the government wants to censor speech. I mean, even in the context of COVID, uh, Minister LeBlanc floated this notion of better policing disinformation as it relates to the pandemic and, and public health information. We do already restrict free speech. I don't see the contours of the harmful speech needing to change. We've already got the contours as it relates to defamation, harassment. We have contours as it relates to hate speech. So let's assume we don't draw any new lines around different kinds of speech. And instead, we're, it, it seems to me an enforcement issue. It is difficult where so many people are, are making comments online. It's difficult for me to have a, an, a John Doe application in court that seeks the IP address, that seeks out the MAC address, and then brings a, a, a knock-on action for, I don't know, harassment or defamation. It, 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 there, there are major legal burdens in between the initial speech and, and getting any sort of compensation or accountability. That's the transition to the liability conversation. And there's two ways I think of looking at the problem. One is you could say, okay, our speech laws are sufficient. We just need to figure out how and if we can apply them to the digital public sphere, right? To this new way in which speech is disseminated. And maybe it's just a matter of applying those previous laws to this space. It's also possible that the nature of that digital infrastructure is such that it demands new laws and regulations because the nature of speech has fundamentally changed. A good example of this would be how harmful speech spreads via algorithmic systems on these platforms. So put a nuance to that, a speech act on a platform is not just the matter of an individual who may or may not be liable for that content posting a piece of content and that content being shown to the people who follow that particular individual. In which case, some sort of just direct liability to the speaker might make sense. But that piece of content can also be amplified to any number of people across the network that the company controls. And that act of amplification, of deciding what speech should be seen and by whom, is arguably in itself an act of speech. And if it is, then we should be talking about should that act of speech be held liable in addition to the original speaker? Where you have intermediaries, there is reason to value Safe Harbor if I am simply a platform that is hosting and I I can't be expected to police everything because I'm not making an active contribution to the dissemination of it per se, but where editors have been replaced by algorithms and the platforms are then actively through AI selecting content to promote, surely there has to be responsibility there. And so then we do need new rules, not necessarily to restrict additional content because of the what kind of content it is, but to put additional onus on a th- the third-party intermediary. I agree. Now, the, the challenge of it comes in implementation, though. 
they're they're getting there, right? And this is where the COVID aspect of this becomes really clear is they have definitely taken on a much more aggressive moderating role and definition of harm than they did pre this crisis. No question. It's actually been a positive development from the platforms and I hope it continues. Agreed. Now, now they've been quick to say, actually, nothing's changed. We still are just applying our terms of service as we always have. They have a real incentive to argue nothing's changed because then they can go back after this to those previous norms. I actually think something has changed, though. I think we broaden our definition of harms that they are willing to take down and able to take down. I know Germany's rule is to penalize companies that keep content up. And I, I know very smart people have raised some caution and concern because it gives an incentive to take content down and leaves that decision entirely in the hands of the company. And so we don't maybe have enough public oversight of those processes, which is an important piece to have. We can't outsource to the private sector what is really a job for public governments and, and public institutions. You should pause on that though, right? Because that's a very loaded and controversial statement that at the moment, there is a real argument over whether we want private companies or governments determining acceptable speech. And a lot of people would rather have private companies and individual actors using those services make that decision. Well, I think they both have to. So I think they both do too. Yeah. But, but I personally side much more on the side that you mentioned, but it's not an incontroversial statement. Maybe I shouldn't be so quick to say uh, we shouldn't draw additional restrictions because I, I personally feel that way, but others don't necessarily feel that way. And so there is a debate to be had about what additional restrictions maybe ought to be put in place. But if you assume that the government is responsible for its public facing rules, so where something is against the law already, it is our job to enforce it and then finding best yes. practices to enforce it. I, I question whether we say to Facebook, this is against the law, so you're responsible for policing this public law. That I have challenges with. But certainly, Facebook is absolutely entitled to have its own community standards. And if you're playing on Xbox Live, I mean, you're not able to have horrible words and racist words in, 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 your, in your name. I mean, that's a community standards measure that isn't contrary to the law per se, but is certainly contrary to what the company wants to, the community that that company wants to build. Part of this trade-off between private entities and democratic governments, I think many democratic governments being very hesitant to step into what are these really difficult political debates, as you mentioned, and being okay delegating that authority and decision-making to the companies. So you have company content moderation moderators making decisions that, in my view, are probably the purview of a democratic government. But that's going to take governments stepping into this space and being willing to both have that conversation about what kind of speech we think is acceptable as a society on these platforms and what isn't, and then enforcing that on the companies themselves. And I think a great example of this is, is the Canadian election law, where the government said that political advertising needs to be archived on platforms, but it didn't define what a political ad was, because that was a sensitive conversation to get into. And so they very sensibly said political and issue ads need to be archived and made public. But they didn't do the hard work of defining what those were and left that to foreign companies to decide. So we were in this situation where foreign companies were deciding what was allowable political speech inside a Canadian election, which I don't think they did a horrible job at that, but I'm not sure they were the entities that should have been making that decision. I don't know what the ultimate answer is in terms of institutional structure, but it seems obvious enough that we need fairly nimble judicial or administrative review bodies that can act quickly where maybe Facebook makes the decision in the first instance. The alt There's got to be an ultimate and, and fairly quick appeal process, I think, to a, a public body in the end. The, 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 other, the other piece to close off the algorithmic accountability, which is complicated in many respects, but can also be fairly simple in other respects when you look at the GDPR and this idea of algorithmic explainability, at a minimum, surely we want our privacy and or data regulators to be able to audit, look under the hood and ensure that 
the inputs and outputs. They don't have to completely understand the black box, but at a, at a minimum, understanding the inputs and the outputs seems plausible and policing that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a big debate about what auditing might look like, how you might do it, what the technicalities of it are. But I think the principle is pretty sound, and we do this in other aspects of, of very complex aspects of society. We do it for drug regulation and the development of pharmaceuticals. We do it for financial algorithms, doing automated trading, right? We do it for the banking system. So these are all very complicated technical systems that we have found a way to oversee. There's no reason to me why we can't do that here too. It's a political question, right? Are we going to figure out how to do it and then impose it on what are very powerful international companies? Which you draw that line in your recent article as between financial stability board and a digital stability board that we maybe don't need to reinvent the wheel in all of these difficult policy areas. We should look to where we've had success or where we have been able to sufficiently regulate companies in similar contexts. Yeah, both domestically and internationally, we figured out ways of providing some degree of governance and accountability on very complex systems. And I don't see why this should be any different. It's just going to require a bit of creativity in designing and experimenting with those governance mechanisms. Uh, you were involved in the Digital Democracy Project, which looked at the recent Canadian election. And now you are looking at misinformation, disinformation online with respect to COVID-19. What lessons have you learned from the Digital Democracy Project and your recent work? The short answer around the election is that we actually didn't see the levels of mis- and disinformation as we expected to. I think there's a number of reasons for that. One of them is... I think the Canadian government actually put some smart legislation in place that made some of the low-hanging fruit of disinformation and misinformation campaigns much more difficult. So the ban on foreign digital ads, the mandated archive for, for domestic political ads, the limits on third-party digital spends, all of these things were based on the types of tools and vulnerabilities in the platform that the Canadian government saw in other countries play out in the US, in the EU elections, in elections around the world. And I think they probably had an effect. So a relatively good news story from the Canadian election. And with COVID? COVID is worse, <laughs> unfortunately not. Uh, and this is part of the problem. So the restrictions we put on the activity of speech on platforms were only for election periods. And we know that a whole host of speech circulates at all times outside of elections that can have a negative impact on these systems. And so after an election, when you release, you, you get rid of all these restrictions, it becomes the sort of free market again. And now we are seeing a fair amount of damaging content circulate. And we're actually sort of going a step further with some of the analysis where um, a lot of the work on misinformation and disinformation just looks at how much bad stuff is circulating around and who is exposed to it. What we're trying to do is then do another layer of work that looks at the behavioral change of people who are exposed to it. And with COVID, we're seeing something pretty alarming, which is that there's way more false information on social media than in traditional media. The people who consume more information on that social media have more f false beliefs about COVID, right? So the exposure to the information is creating a change in perception of the problem. And then with surveys, we can then see that those same people are less likely to do the things that we know collectively we need to, need to do to address the problem, like social distancing. So you're seeing this direct connection from exposure to changes in beliefs to changes in behavior. And to us, that's incredibly worrying. Well, and, and all the more worrying because unlike a scenario where I change my behavior to my own detriment, this is changing behavior to the detriment of society's efforts to tackle the pandemic. Right. I mean, if, if ever anybody doubted that the integrity of information in our society was important and the reliability of information, the exception should be the moment in which we all need to know and do similar things together. And we're in one of those moments. We all need reliable information and we all need similar reliable information and be willing to do similar things based on that information. And that is very difficult to do in the current nature of our information system.
And do you get a sense then, having looked at the problem, when you hear Damien Collins in the UK suggesting additional rules for that kind of harmful speech, do you see that as being effective? Or again, should the focus be on the platforms to better police the content and to downgrade content and to ensure that they aren't promoting that kind of content? Yeah, I mean, to come back full circle, the problem of disinformation is a structural one. It is embedded in the design and the incentives of the system itself, of the technology itself. So any efforts to combat disinformation by simply highlighting and removing bad information or stopping the distributors of bad information is just treating the symptom, not the core cause. And the core cause is that incentive structure. So then to close the loop on that, we've talked about solutions, but the solutions have largely been to the significant symptoms, but symptoms as you describe them. Would the solution to that problematic financial incentive not be to simply take that financial incentive away? So we are not going to penalize additional content per se in the sense of criminal liability, in the sense of fines per se, but we are going to have a disgorgement remedy where if you have profited from harmful content, however we want to describe that, and let's just say for the time being, it is illegal content. So we bracket out the, should there be new speech laws? So where the company has profited from, and they know the number of people who have seen the content, they know the number of ads that they have served based on those eyeballs. Wouldn't they know their revenue? And can't we just say you can't profit from it? So you're going to pay into this trust? I mean, I think that's a potentially very creative solution. There are certain potential policy solutions that are beyond the pale for companies because, and again, come again, come full circle, these are publicly traded private companies who have a mandate to make more money each quarter than the quarter before. So they de facto cannot enter into conversations with politicians like yourself or governments like Canada that would necessarily see revenue decrease. And that's a, that's a problem, right? It's not the government of Canada's problem, but it's a problem in this disconnect between needing them to enforce some of these rules and the nature of some of the rules that might need to be placed on them. How did you come to focus on these issues in the first place? For a long time, I would, be, would have placed my work in thinking in a category of technology optimist, where I was excited by, engaged in all of the empowering things that digital technologies were doing, particularly in the international affairs space, right? In the spaces of development, in the way journalism was being done globally, in the way different activist groups were being empowered to, to push back against autocratic regimes. You'd open Canada.org, that, that work. Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely. And, and in my own academic work, right? I wrote a book that was largely about the empowering aspects of technology um, in the international affairs space. And like the world, your work then took a dark turn. <laughs> to a certain degree, yeah. And I, I, just, I think a lot of the people who study technology went through a similar arc here, that they were largely studying and trying to understand all of the social effects, and many of those were positive for a long time. But something has changed, and a lot of that community has started focusing more and more on raising awareness of those negative costs. And that's put a lot of people, including myself, in, in this sort of odd position of not just studying this space, but becoming sort of a policy activist in it, of just trying to raise awareness to the, both the public and to governments that this laissez-faire approach they've had to this space, where they've left it ungoverned, has had these negative costs. That's almost evolved to a, to a next phase of where governments and the public have now sort of said, okay, we get it. There are negative costs. What do we do about it? It's worth just reflecting when the sort of despair sits in in this, that we are in a very different place than we were three or four years ago, where even talking about regulating or the negative effects of some of these technologies was just outside of the political debate entirely. We can argue about whether it's sufficient or not, but now we have election rules in place. We have a digital charter and espouses a set of principles, and we have a commitment in the course of this past election pre-pandemic. And so the work is to come after we're, we're out of this crisis, no doubt. But there is a clear commitment to do more, to strengthen privacy, to strengthen civic media as a public good, to tackle some of these tax policy issues where Canada is part of 
international efforts at the OECD, certainly. So this work is underway, just so far incomplete. So all the more reason that we have to con continue that work and, and make sure that if we have this conversation five years from now, you're, you're maybe a tech optimist again. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Taylor. I appreciate it. Take care. Talk soon. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Uncommons. Thanks, of course, to Taylor for his time. Remember to subscribe for future episodes at uncommons.ca. We'll be joined in the future by expert and author Shoshana Zuboff. We'll be joined by Federal Court of Appeal Justice David Stratus. We'll be joined by parliamentary colleagues like Adam Vancouverton. So again, subscribe at uncommons.ca. And lastly, a big thank you to Hannah Kaplan for the artwork for this podcast and to Seamus Erskine for the music.